Greetings Petrolheads, welcome back to Automation and today I'm going to be doing a little tutorial video on how to build a specific, like how to build a good car for a specific um, market because Donovan Chapman on Facebook contacted me and uh, said it would be a good idea to do something like this because there is a lot of new players in automation and like there has been ever since the Steam release and there is a chance that some of them actually are watching my channel and if you are and if you're wondering you know uh, oh I, I, I don't know how to build say a, a light sports car or something like that um, or how to properly set it up to make it competitive then I will show you how to do that first of all let me let's just uh, open any any car right here uh, to explain the market and uh, the whole market segments a little bit so don't worry this is uh, this is uh, great because this coupe body shell is old and but we don't have a newer one of this size so anyway uh, for example let's see here family sport you can see in the in this corner down here that um, the requirements that it takes to to be competitive in a specific uh, market segment for example for family sport you can see that drivability is important spoilerness is even a little bit more important than that with 17.3 percent and those percentages mean um, like the percentages or oh, let me uh, try to explain this differently um, your competitiveness score um, is put together by these percentages down here and for example 16.3 percent of your total competitiveness is calculated from your drivability 17.3 like spoilerness makes up 17.3 percent of your total competitiveness score Comfort makes up 10.5% of that score and so on and so forth. So you can see that we should put our focus for this particular category onto drivability, sportiness and safety, but also, you know, prestige, practicality and comfort are pretty important. Economy, not so much. Cornering, a little bit and reliability a little bit more than in cornering, but the main the main uh, stats we should be looking out for if you want to build a good family sports car are sportiness, drivability and safety. And with that let's actually try and you know what we, we should I should actually have a pretty good car for this already. The Puma. Um, So let's see yeah family sport premium you can see 95.9 um, 95.9 competitiveness and 93.3 percent affordability uh, what's this I mean we are now in the family sport premium category where family sport it's a little bit too expensive for that uh, therefore family sport premium okay uh, Sportiness and drivability and safety are still the three main stats here, but comfort and prestige are more important than than on the regular family sport category and also economy and reliability are not important at all. And so what what makes this car? Why why is this so competitive here in, in this category? Uh, first of all, since we do want sportiness we are obviously going uh, we are obviously going to choose a monocoque chassis and to keep it lightweight and relatively prestigious without being overly expensive we go for aluminium um, on the chassis material you could also make a pretty good case for aluminium body panels um, they add a little bit more weight but they are also more prestigious it shouldn't change things too much but um, it will it will still affect it a little bit we went for a double wishbone front suspension and multi-link rear suspension because while they are the most expensive options they are also the best in drivability and sportiness and comfort um, engine wise now 
generally a rule of thumb if you want to build a a, uh, f a family car if you want to build a comfortable car a car where you know ride quality and comfort matters you want to go for an inline six because the inline six configuration is the smoothest running because um basically um there's four steps to every um to every combustion and since you have six cylinders that's more than four and you will have you know if if, if you imagine um a, a clock with the, the four quarters you will have not only one one cylinder at each of these four quarters but you will have actually two more to um balance the engine uh, e even more like I, I don't know how to properly explain this in English but I hope you can follow me and this I know I didn't use the correct terms there but uh, you get the idea it's 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 um, it ba it's the most balanced inline engine configuration short of an inline 8 of course or even bigger inline engines um, and therefore it is better suited for a comfortable car then not only an inline four but also then a v6 because on a v6 you only have three cylinders per cylinder bank so you're basically missing one of those four quarters if that makes any sense um on on every rotation so you get a little bit of a rougher um a little bit less smooth running engine is what you get and so now now that i've explained why we go for an inland six um dual override cam like this is this is not mandatory to go for five dollars per cylinder i chose it because of its power potential and economy potential it is also the um the most expensive option and it's also the least reliable option well barely after the dual override cam with four dollars per cylinder it doesn't make a big difference but um I chose it because you know it's a it's a premium engine for a premium car uh, don't mind these being red this is a display um, this is uh, displayed improperly that I've, I've admitted that a couple of times so for the crank we went for forged steel you could also go for billet steel which is a little bit more expensive it doesn't really add too much it adds a little bit more smoothness even so it might make the the overall score better but it will also add a little bit more production unit in our case that's only 1.8 while saving six dollars of material cost it's basically it doesn't make a big difference i beam titanium to ensure for the best possible smoothness and reliability and forged pistons because we are not revving this engine very high uh, we are making a good amount of torque though relative to its capacity then uh, generally the idea was since the red line is at about 7000 rpm since this is the sportier version of this engine um, we wanted the the turbo to spool up before 3000 rpm so so to give you an, an impression that the, the the engine actually has torque because if you make it spool at, at like 4,000 or 4,500 where we are already at our max torque then what happens is when you drive it in an everyday situation at you know about you know say 1500 to 3000 rpm then you will get no power at all and it will feel very weak and you're gonna have to wind it out and that's uh, that's making for worse fuel economy whereas here the green line represents the fuel usage per like at each specific rpm and you can see that between uh between like say 2500 and 4000 we have our lowest economy our best economy and that is where you should drive this engine if you want to be economical for the turbo setup um i'm still not like i still don't know the everything about how to properly tune your turbo setup but generally a bigger compressor makes your makes your um, turbo spool up later 
and it will give you give you more power later whereas the turbine size if you crank that up the turbo will spool up later but the power will um will come earlier the max power for example what is this at 46.5 if we crank this up here you can see that we are now making more power and we're making it earlier than before however it, it drops off quite harshly afterwards and that is what the turbine size does if you increase it too much so we were at 46.5 um, whereas the compressor like you can't see it actually evening this this part back here out of the of the yellow turbo graph because like the we we have cut off the rev limit at the 7000 rpm but it would go on for much longer so this was at 50 the ar ratio is one thing that i that i still don't quite understand what it actually is but um it it works similarly to the compressor only that it doesn't affect your turbo spool up time as much it 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 makes you like it lets you have your turbo spool up at almost the same rpm while also make uh allowing for later power output and more power output at you know at the later rpm max boost is obviously how much pressure you you're making the maximum boost that your turbo makes uh, once it's pulled up or, uh, fully and if you increase that by a lot then you will gain more power potentially but also uh, it'll come earlier and it'll drop mm, drop uh, it'll drop off earlier similar to the turbine only that the max boost also affects your um, fuel octane quite a lot and therefore you're gonna have to decrease your compression which in return will make for worse fuel economy so you wanna so you wanna have a bit of max boost like if everything up to say 0.9 bar is acceptable for an for an economical or everyday engine if you want to go for a more sporty engine you can go up to like 1.3 1.4 bars 1.4 is already quite a lot but um everything over 1.5 bars is just for supercars and you know drag racing and all that all that kind of stuff in our case we kept it at 0.75 because that is that makes for a reasonable economy and will still give us a decent amount of power direct injection that is basically what you use these days in 2015 unless you're a, unless you're a dacia i guess and uh single configuration because this is not an an, an all-out sports car this is you know as a small family uh, usable family friendly saloon with uh, 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 with quite a punch if you want it but it's not overly sporty and the intake is standard because that is what you should use on most road cars unless they're you know proper performance cars and premium fuel because that's standard in middle europe and an exhaust we don't have a choice here and exhaust diameter is an, another interesting one on it on turbo engines in particular because turbo engines can do with a little bit more airflow through the through the exhaust you can see that our exhaust currently has a max power of 342 horsepower if we decrease this by a little bit it would still have a max power for like it would still be suited for up to 291 horsepower but it did decrease our max power output and it is restricting the airflow a little bit that is because of the turbos um, because with the turbos you're basically sending more air into the engine thus um, 
there's you, you can also handle more airflow out of the engine than than would normally be necessary if this was a naturally aspirated engine i would probably actually lose power by increasing this further but um on a, tur a turbo engine can handle this we have high flow freeway cats because that is also pretty standard these days and straight through mufflers because it is a little bit of a sporty car you want to hear a little bit of the engine but because of the turbo it's not too loud anyway 31.7 is quite decent and we have a six-speed manual gearbox which is well drivability is low for the for the manual gearbox does nobody know how to drive a manual or what is that something weird and um, I'm just joking by the way it does it does make for a good sportiness because you know car enthusiasts will definitely agree with me it's just more involving to shift yourself to actually clutch in move the gear lever and whatnot uh, top speed is like I, rest I I geared it to 275 we have just a little bit of over overrun and in order to ensure best performance we have the second gear go up to 100 kilometers an hour the viscous LSD now here, here's something that you can do uh, we could definitely go for an electric LSD as you can see it would add drivability sportiness and off-road ability However, it would also cost about a thousand seven hundred dollars more and add five more production units. So if we choose this, we would lose competitiveness and affordability because it is getting too expensive. For the tires, I recommend sports compound road tires if it's a sporty car um, because sports tires on basically any car make for the best possible amount of grip short of semi slicks which we would only use on you know full on track or racing cars anyway uh the, the tire width is something that you like one of the two main factors for the for the steering behavior graph um the other one is obviously the suspension and basically for a family sport premium car if we go back to the markets and see what we need we need more sportiness than drivability however drivability is still very important um, that should give you a little bit of an idea of how you should tune your suspension actually we are more on the drivability side here so we can we can change this a little bit how do we change it for example we can we can reduce the rear tire width a little bit and we have a, and this actually increased our our competitiveness and we have we now have 0.96 bonus and 0.95 drivability which is a happy medium i would say you can also say uh, see that the sportiness went up while the drivability went down a little bit we might actually keep it this way and uh, comfort went up for reasons i don't fully know however the the zero to 100 times suffered because we are now you know we now have less grip on the rear axle which is the one that we're driving and uh, wheel spin went up and also you can like if you're building a sports car obviously your sports uh, your sportiness multiplier let's call these numbers of 0.96 and 0.95 in our in our case uh, these multipliers um, should more should be more on the sporty side than on the drivability side if you're building a sports car however if you're building something like uh, this something like the computer premium it should be quite a lot more on the on the drivability side and also you can see here that we have standard springs because we want uh, semi-active dampers and active sway bars why do we want this setup rather than you know say active comfort and then semi-active and passive because active comfort will give us like will reduce our 
sportiness and it will also reduce our drivability i didn't consider that also it makes our car a little bit uh, a little bit oversteer it is uh, here in this case and uh, what else i have to say yes standard springs are just you know regular old springs it's nothing too fancy and semi-active dampers will make for the best sportiness and best comfort and then the active sway bars will make our drivability very high and also give us a lot of sportiness and 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 comfort whereas if we go for the active comfort drivability is only average sportiness is high comfort is high off-road is very high but then on the passive sway bars everything's just average and uh, Generally speaking, as far as suspension tuning goes, the front axle is like the front wheels are the ones turning. So if you if you make your front suspension very stiff, then that'll mean that you can corner quickly, but it might also lose grip quickly because it's um. How do I explain this properly? Um, so you can you can basically think of it that um stiff stiff suspension like stiff the word stiff allows for not very much movement not very much tolerance if you will and uh whereas softer suspension make it so makes it so you have the car rolls a little bit more but it also leans a little bit more into the corner so it will um so for the front axle that'll mean that you can you can reduce understeer that way because if the front and uh, front wheels lose grip you get understeer if the rear wheels lose grip you get oversteer and uh, obviously softer rear suspension reduces oversteer um sure we could make this car have a very soft suspension in general and that'll probably help our comfort um but also that'll make our roll angle pretty high and we will lose a lot of sportiness and what was i about to say about suspensions in general yeah um stiff s having a stiff suspension setup on one axle means that you are a little bit more likely to lose grip on that and on that axle but you can also you, you have more stability if you don't if that makes any sense um how do like how do i put this in proper words um so you can only make your suspension so stiff there there's like a limit of how stiff you can make it and that varies from car to car obviously you have to you have to consider this this graph which helps quite a lot if i go over the stiff on the rear sway bars for example you can see that now stiffening it up we get more more and more sportiness but if i go too high this can actually take quite a lot of rear sway bar yeah it did already hurt our drivability and sportiness wait what is it at 300 kilogram per degree let's put it at like 500 something like that and if I then go for stiffer rear springs, those will actually give us more stability. So they will kind of reduce oversteer. If you make the front springs stiffer, they will reduce understeer. Okay. Uh, front camber, more front camber. You can see even though the the yellow line which indicates our steering behavior is to the left of the of the red line on this upper section which means we have a little bit of oversteer and then it starts to understeer that's like horrible that's absolutely horrible steering behavior that we have right here because you don't want like when you also something people seemingly seemingly don't always understand is that the steering behavior indicates 
what your car does when you're turning in without applying throttle. So I, I've gotten a lot of comments in on my automation video where you know on a sports car I tuned the suspension so that it would slightly under so that it would be slightly on the understeer side on this graph. And they would say, "Oh, this isn't a proper sports car. Understeer is not sporty." And uh, well, do do you want a car that? If, if you drive it every day in every single corner it oversteers naturally without you doing anything do you want do you really want to drive something like that i don't think you do and um obviously on a rear wheel drive car with a half decent amount of power at least um you're gonna be able to make it oversteer regardless if you just uh give it some throttle during the corner so this is this is where we were at this was where we want to be we have a happy medium be between sportiness and drivability and the right height i chose in such a way that we do not get bottoming out because the bottoming out it is associated with a drivability penalty so overall we have 49.7 drivability 44.9 sportiness 45.4 comfort 27.5 prestige and 62.4 safety which means for the sp for the family sport premium category we are very competitive 97.4 and quite affordable as well um, as far as the price goes that's also something that I would like to explain a little bit um, this right here when it's at zero percent is the bare minimum um, price that you would be able to sell your car for in order to even break even if, if in order to break even with the with the costs that you have with the where are they now total costs in production units because production units are obviously also associated with costs you gotta pay with your workmen and uh, I would suggest that for smaller cars that are, for example, for a, for a city hatchback, I would suggest probably like 5% uh, of, of profit or something like that, because you're probably expecting to sell many of them. Whereas for if, if you have, say, a, a limited edition supercar, you would probably look more at like plus 30 percent or plus even plus 50 percent so that the the few units that you sell will actually return great profit so you have more money available for future research and and whatnot for this car since it's a smaller family saloon car and i and the base price is suggested at 30,100. I added plus 10 percent to put it kind of slightly below the bmw 3 series because that's what it probably will be that's what it uh, will be competing with i guess and uh yeah i hope this explains the the family sport premium category a little bit so basically if we want to sum it up aluminium chassis aluminium or or uh or polymer panels best suspension op options like in the model trim and a, a smooth inland six turbo engine with with the turbo spooling up before the f uh, before the before halfway through the through the um, rpms and then a, a steering behavior that is somewhere between sp like a happy medium between spoilers and uh, drivability that is basically what i would like to how i would like to sum it up hope you guys enjoyed hope you guys learned something leave me feedback on what i could improve thanks for watching i will see you next time